<clears throat> Welcome to a well, wow, it's two Wednesday morning, and I'm already screwing up. I'm going to try that again. Let's try that again. Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews with Christopher Brown. I'm your host, Christopher Brown, and today I am pleased and honored to have our guest in on the show. He is the I want to get this right, the founder and executive director of the Alberta Humanist Association here in the province of Alberta, Jonathan Parks. Jonathan, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure. Chris, thank you for the invite. It's great to be here. Um, so this is our community spotlight uh, episode where we talk about a organization within the province and we let them talk about who they are, what they do and how they move forward from 2022 and the last few years during COVID. Um, Jonathan, I got to start off with the question that is probably on everyone's mind. Who are the Alberta Humanist Association or what is the Alberta Humanist Association? Awesome. Um, well, great question. So uh, the, the Alberta Humanist Association uh, uh, desires to reach out to uh, one of Alberta's largest demographics known as the non-religious. Um, in 2011, uh, the numbers started to really climb about with that demographic and uh, we're projected to being uh, as the next census uh, launches out in November to be around 1.5 million uh, makeup of Alberta's population. So it's a, one of the fastest growing uh, demographics in the province. And uh, if you've been, if anyone's been paying attention to the uh, demographic growth across Canada, it is one of the fastest growing uh, demographics in the country. So uh, yeah, our desire is to reach out to uh, Alberta's non-religious population. So what do you mean by non-religious? Because there, there's many connotations with that, because I just want to narrow down here, because uh, what I believe is non-religious and someone else believe is non-religious, some might say non-religious is, okay, I believe in God, but I don't go to church, but I'm not religious in the sense that I go to church. Is that what you're talking about? Or are you talking about atheism, uh, agnostic? What What is non-religious to the Alberta Humanist Association? Well, uh, correct. Uh, it does. Uh, the demographic uh, really makes up a lot of different people. Uh, specifically, the Alberta Humanist Association reaches out to humanists, atheists, uh, agnostics, um, kind of skeptics, uh, anyone who really uh, is on the spectrum of, I, I really don't see the evidence out there for God, but there could be. Um, so I really, for myself specifically, identify as agnostic humanist atheist. So that kind of incorporates a couple of different thoughts, but merged together, that would make up uh, who I identify as specifically. And that would be someone, uh, but that would be the demographic primarily that um, the Alberta Humanist Association specifically uh, seeks to represent and reach out to. And, uh, but again, um, as a humanist organization, secularism is at the core of our uh, vision. And uh, secularism is really, um, in its honest and true form, a very inclusive uh, struct political structure. So it even reaches out to people who are, say, religious and secular, which there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding about that term. So uh, narrowly narrowing it down, it would more speak towards people who uh, are non-deist. Um, but then again, it does reach into a broader uh, kind of audience. Well, and I want to break that down because I find this uh, conversation is going to be so fascinating, uh, fascinating for myself because um, I didn't know about your organization until you and I met at a Green Party of Alberta event. And then I, uh, mm -hmm. you followed me, I followed you, and then I looked into the your Twitter profile and I learned a little bit more and I was like, hey, this would be great to have a conversation about this because I think it's needed in this uh, today's age, today's age. What is a humanist? Because I want to talk about some of the uh, the terms that you've used so far in our brief conversation. So in your words, what is a humanist? And then we'll go into what is an agnostic and a secularism as well. So first off, what is a humanist? Because you identify yourself as, I'm going to try and get this right, a agnostic humanist atheist. So I'm just trying to, I, I know what the first and last word means. I just don't know what the middle one means. Of course. Um, well, uh, I describe myself as somebody who, who, so a humanist really is somebody who um, looks to the prime importance to solve uh, world problems as uh, towards the human. So, uh, you know, we have human created problems, uh, climate change and human rights issues. You know, we're the source of a lot of the issues, if not nearly all of them on this planet. 
And so humanists uh, see humans as the sole um, individual who can solve those problems. So instead of uh, seeking a divine intervention or supernatural matters, humanists really stress the importance and the value of goodness in human beings. So we are capable of solving world problems. And uh, yeah, so it, it's, we really center around the human need, uh, the human value, the human identity, the human uh, dignity, all of those incorporate what humanists uh, believe in and view uh, themselves as. And so, uh, you know, we seek a, a rational way of looking at solving human problems and, you know, using critical thinking and human compassion and empathy and, uh, you know, really campaigning for uh, human rights. And so that kind of in a nutshell, hopefully kind of narrows that definition down for people who might not be fami as familiar with the term. So uh, basically just focusing on the importance of uh, enabling humans to solve all of the issues that we face uh, on this planet. You, you use the word secularism as well, and I appreciate your answer on that humanist. What to you and to the Alberta uh, AHA, I'm just going to call it that from now on, just because it's a short form there, but uh, what to you uh, and the Alberta Humanist Association, what is secularism? And then we'll get into some nitty gritty policy talk here, because this is the part where I'm going to enjoy myself a lot more. <laughs> No, for sure. So, you know, what is secularism? Well, when secularists talk about secularism, they're basically talking about a political idea. So a way of organizing, you know, a state and its society in relation to religion, uh, belief and non-belief. So secularism is really just a framework for society, uh, for striving equality in every aspect, aspects of politics, education, healthcare, law, all of that kind of thing. Um, so secularism uh, is to create a society in which people of all religions or people who don't have or belong to uh, a faith of any kind or a spiritual community can live together peacefully. Uh, so it says that no one shall really be subject to uh, at all to discrimination uh, by any state institution, you know, group of persons or a person on the grounds of religion or others beliefs. So, um, you know, we uh, as humanists, we look at three, you know, core uh, principles of secularism. So it's institutional separation from uh, freedom of belief and uh, no discrimination on the grounds of religion. So these can uh, these conditions allow for competing concepts of uh, of the good life to be pursued in society. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, misinformation. Uh, that's been spread about secularism, uh, even from people who are non-religious and even might identify uh, as atheists. So uh, one of the big things, especially by humanist organizations around the world, is, is to you know, really clear up uh, all of that misinformation or disinformation about what secularism is. And the number one thing is that it's not atheism. So secularism and atheism are not, uh, they're not the same thing. So it's been around for, you know, many, many years, uh, even into the 18th century and before. And uh, so, you know, secularism, atheism are really, uh, you know, two different ideas. You know, the latter being the denial of a theist claims uh, to the certainty of having access to supernatural knowledge and revealed wisdom. Uh, and the former, you know, being a political ideology, which maintains that the matters of supernatural and divine have nothing to do with the state. Uh, and neither does one religion have, you know, dominion over another um, or condoned by any other religion. And it's not, you know, the ending of religion either as, on the uh, atheist side. So it's, it's not stamping out religion. It's not, you know, uh, shutting down uh, places of worship. Uh, it's just creating this structure in which all people and different, you know, thoughts of belief and, and matters in that area can come together and work and say, hey, you know, we share the space on planet Earth. We might have different positions on where we feel we've come from, but we all agree that we live on one planet. We are one people and we can work together. And so, you know, secularism is not uh, atheism, period. It doesn't make a position on atheism. It doesn't campaign for atheism. And uh, there's a lot of people both in, you know, the religious, some, some religious communities, I definitely can't say all because there's some wonderful secular religious people out there that identify the necessity for uh, secularism. Uh, and then as well on the atheist side or the agnostic or whichever camp of uh, belief or non-belief you might fall into. So uh, secularism is not, is also not humanism. 
So humanism is an ethical philosophy that addresses how do we live the good life without religion. Uh, and you can be a humanist, uh, an atheist, or a secularist at the same time if you choose, uh, but they are not all the same thing. Okay, I appreciate that because the next question then gives my listeners and my viewers and myself a better understanding how a boy from Ontario, yourself, moves to Alberta and starts the Alberta Humanist Association, because I'm going to read your bio, which is currently on the website, and anyone who wants to find out more out about the Alberta Humanist Association, links are in the show notes, so please just scroll down and you'll find it there. But born and raised in Ontario, Jonathan, yourself, who uses the pronouns he and him, is a Bible college graduate from New Brunswick Bible Institute at Master's College and Seminary, Former church pastor with the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada, he is now actively involved in the secular social justice movement. He is the founder and executive director of the Alberta Humanist Association. So how does a guy born and raised in, I, I know where you're from, rural Ontario, uh, Belleville, North Belleville area, which where uh, that's when we had that connection, um, move from Ontario to New Brunswick, gets a uh, college graduate from a bible institute former church pastor become a agnostic humanist atheist <laughs> that's a loaded question <laughs> Which, it's a very loaded question we, I, 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 I love loaded questions <laughs> <laughs> no same thing same here um yeah great question uh and, and it's a long story so i'm going to give you the abbreviated version but um, no, uh, so I was a church pastor right up until about December 18th of 2011. Um, very unhappy with institutional Christianity. Uh, and I'm a two feet in, two feet out kind of guy. So um, if I am, you know, if I firmly believe in something, I give it all. And, uh, you know, anyone from my previous church history would attest to that. And uh, so I, I started to um, challenge, you know, uh, what was going on in the church and the theatricals, just like you had to really build up the Sunday morning to, you know, really uh, make things move in the service. And it was, you know, and I, I, I'm not afraid of the spotlight at all. So it wasn't hard for me, but I was thinking like, wow, Sunday mornings are so powerful, but Mondays are, you know, are, you know, deity non-existent. And what is going on with this? How did we get here? So I, you know, I took my Bible college knowledge and education and, and really started pouring over history, church history. So the last 1700 years, you know, um, the history of the Bible and how we got it about that. And I just began to see serious cracks in the, founda the church foundation. And uh, I, I just couldn't believe what I was finding. You know, I came across a book, for example, by Frank Viola, Pagan Christianity. And uh, there is so much paganism, you know, uh, I just seemed like Christianity is a sponge religion wherever it went, you know, we, we soaked up the, the local, you know, religious identity and rang it out Christian. And that was how we evangelized or proselytized for 1700 years. And I said, this has got to be where the, you know, the spirit of God has gone. And I'm like, you know, trying to, you know, so I spent from the end of 2011 to, you know, September of 2017, really getting down to the heart of things. And uh, I ended up leaving um, Toronto, Ontario, and I got connected with people in love with a movement that is known as the House Church Movement. House Church Movement, who are really passionate about, you know, um, really ripping away institutional Christianity and all these pagan, you know, inclusions and amalgamations to get back to the spirit of God. And because, uh, as you know, Pentecostalism is very uh, charismatic um, denomination in Canada and across the world. And so we really banked on that experience in the spirit of God. Uh, so anyways, we went, we went down into uh, Saskatchewan. I moved there. I got connected with some people. And, uh, you know, we hear about some ugly church, um, you know, uh, fight, infighting and, and all that kind of thing. Well, you know, a lot of people think that that can be a very toxic environment. But imagine having all of the institutional structures stripped away and it's just raw people. And it was worse in the house church movement. And if you read up about it, it's got a life expectancy of one to two, maybe three years max. And then it crumbles away because people eat each other alive. I'm like, how can a people who pulled all these things away uh, miss the spirit? Like this, it should be the center focus of what we're doing here. 
And I just continued to dig and dig. And I had warnings from people that did not like me leaving the church. It was a very big controversial thing. And they said, if you continue to dig, you're going to leave God. And I'm like, hmm, maybe I should continue to dig. What am I missing? What will I find if I, if I keep digging? And so I continued to dig myself right out of Christianity. And uh, I was shocked at what I saw. And there was a lack of evidence, you know, for uh, a historical Jesus. And uh, I just couldn't believe it. I'm like, if you were to eliminate all the church buildings throughout history, you know, uh, got rid of, you know, all the religious, you know, uh, literature that's out there and you looked at the secular sources for historical Jesus he couldn't be found and our earliest records are hundreds of years after the events happened and I'm like this is insane I'm like I should be able to see evidence so that rattled my faith and I made this journey with a friend in Saskatchewan and one day we were just like maybe there is no God and we immediately got hit with guilt and like you know uh, you know these emotions of fear and I'm like, why are we feeling this way? And so we went back and, you know, kind of just like, okay, we'll put that on the back burner and kept digging some more. And then again, we just were bombarded and uh, just like, I can't believe in this. You know, there's wherever the church went for the last 1700 years, there's bodies dropped. And we see that across Canada, you know, with the um, Truth and Reconciliation Committee finding all these unmarked graves. Uh, you know, even just recently, and uh, it happened throughout the 1700 years of the church's journey. And again, you know, uh, I found 200,000 errors within the Bible. There were just some very gross, you know, things about, you know, coming to grips. And they've always been in the Bible, but the Old Testament being a very bloodbath kind of book and really being honest with ourselves when we read these things. And so anyways, that was our journey out. And there was this, so this happened really in uh, 2017 of September. And this burden just kind of lifted off of my body. And it really opened up my eyes my worldview to being much more bigger and, and, you know, and wider and understanding things differently. And as I've been in, you know, in, in, you know, inundated with it, as I was a Christian for so many years that I started making more sense. And this whole time I was in the closet. So I identify as a, as a, a gay guy and uh, you know, in my time of the church, even in the house church movement, you know, the Bible's very clear, despite that we have communities of progressive LGBTQ plus churches the Bible has always been, you know, very anti-gay. And uh, so, you know, grappling with that and hiding that, but coming out in October of 2017, because it took me a month, I'm like, I can finally be myself. And so then I'm like, okay, where's my community at? Because I felt communityless. I felt ostracized. You know, obviously when I, I made a post on Facebook saying, hey, friends, I know I have a lot of dedicated followers who journeyed with me on my Christianity. If you start seeing things that you disagree with, uh, I want you to know that I really appreciate our relationships that we've developed over the last number of you know decades, but um, I have decided to leave Christianity, embrace my truth and who I am and my identity. And uh, you know, I really appreciate the respectfulness and the, the openness and the welcoming. And if you have questions, I'll do my best to answer it, but I'm not here to defend myself. I'm here to live my life. And so I lost, you know, quite a number of people that were in my life and, uh, I ended up getting connected with a local non-religious community called uh, CFI, so Center for Inquiry Canada. It was a branch in Regina, Saskatchewan, so that's where I was living. And uh, just starting a journey in my own identity. You know, there was so much trauma. Uh, I felt some post-traumatic stress disorder from, you know, my treatment of the non-religious while a church pastor and, and just an evangelical believer, and then how I treated myself and denying my own self and my and condemning myself all the time. And and uh, not being able to overcome. Like, I'll give you a brief example. I remember walking along the road in, uh, along Heartland, New Brunswick, uh, close to Victoria Corner. And my dad, who's suffered from cancer his whole life, um, he's allergic to radiation and chemo and all that. And so he has to get the cancer cut out of him. And so I remember a very emotional conversation numerous times with my mom. And I said, mom, because I was very open with my mom. And I said, mom, I wish I could find, because I, you know, she knew the struggles I had went through with my orientation. And I said, mom, I wish I could find, I wish homosexuality was like a cancer because I would find it with a knife and I would cut it out. And I, it, it never left me. And there, there's, you know, there's all these so-called ministries out there that are completely phony that try to say they can cure homosexuality. It is a mental disorder. There's it's a demonic disorder. 
um, you know, but and I went through various different forms of conversion therapy, and it just made me sick to my stomach that I wasn't able to get over this. And I know there's so many hundreds of thousands of people out there, you know, that can, you know, share in that experience. But when I was able to be myself, it was, I had to give myself permission. So it was a hard journey. And then uh, again, as I was thinking, so where do I fit? You know, and I apologize, Chris, for jumping around. There's so many things to unpack. No, but, and I'm um, so happy that you are. And I apologize for interrupting. It's just, I love this journey that you're taking us on because it makes me better understand where this, where you've come from. So that way the next set of questions aren't completely out to left field. So it helps my listeners, helps me, but it also helps you explain to uh, the world in some sense, your journey to, and I don't want to say this so bluntly, but leaving the church and finding your true self and trying to finding the I don't want to say truth because everyone will say the truth is relevant in this story because it's what your truth was. Totally. Yeah. No. It's um. Yeah. It, it was. It was so important to you know really discover my own identity and where I fit. You know, especially when it came to you know positions of philosophy and worldview and you know is there a God? Can he be known? All of those things and. You know, when I when we go through Bible college, we're trained to look at different, you know, um, uh, world religions and we visit different world religions, whether it's a mosque or a synagogue or, you know, a Hindu temple and all those kind of things. And we're taught how to, you know, um, unpack those and where those ideas come from and how to debate with all these different religious beliefs and and, uh, you know, and how to um, deconstruct them and show them the error of where they've gone. Uh, but we never turn the mirror onto ourselves and our own Christian beliefs. And, and do they hold up? Can they stand under the, the same critique? And so when you do that uh, and you get really honest with yourself, because, you know, you're taught in Bible school, you're taught in church, Sunday school, as a small child, that the enemy is out there to steal, kill, and destroy. He's out there to confuse and, you know, uh, to, to, you know, kind of, as I said a moment ago, just deceive. And so when you are confronted with these inconsistencies, when you're confronted with these errors, when you're confronted with these horrible things in these texts, uh, you're told that the enemy is sowing seeds of doubt and to don't entertain those things because if he can get a foothold in, in, in your life, he will uproot all that God is trying to do and you'll be handed over to the devil. So uh, I really had to grapple with that. And I said, well, okay, well, if there's 200,000 errors in the Bible, if there's all these in historical inconsistencies and things that just don't add up, then obviously I can't trust the Bible. And I've already used the same similar critique on all these other world religions. So that would make me an atheist, you know, and I didn't come into humanism until a little, not, not terribly long after, but a little while after that. Um, and CFI does kind of center around a lot of humanism. They do more uh, atheism in my opinion, but there is a lot of that humanistic approach. So, but unfortunately the CFI Regina, you know, community wasn't really doing a lot. It's really hard in, in these prairie provinces to um, really energize and uh, build that sense of community and support. And, you know, uh, there's, there's great things that are out there for people who have left religion. So like recovering from religion, you know, um, there's so many, you know, that's a program of its own that I think is really helpful because there's people, you know, as a church pastor at the time, you're always looking at statistics. How many people are leaving the church? You know, uh, what's driving people out of the church, you know, and things that are, uh, yeah, 100% honorable are making people run out of the church. And, you know, um, a lot of it always gets blamed to you loved your sin more than God. And that's something I faced all the time. You loved your sin more than God, because eventually I did come out. I came out publicly. And, um, you know, a lot of people said, you didn't love God. You loved your homosexuality. You know, you love you were turned over to a depraved mind. I'm like, yo. Um, if you knew me, you knew how obsessed I was in my Christianity and how much I legitimately condemned it. And not just because I was hiding behind it, but because I was preaching what the Bible said. The Bible is the extended word of God. And so I was preaching that truth. And so I didn't come out, you know, until a month later, but it wasn't like, oh, thank God I can finally be gay. It was like, I can now give my permission because... I don't hold this truth as truth anymore. And so, you know, there's a lot of people that are, are condemned to say, oh, you loved your sin more than God. Well, for a lot of people, that's not at all the case. There are some people for sure that, you know, um, there are things that they feel or believe or 
experience in their life that are driving forces for people to leave religion and different faith groups. Um, you know, and so when they're challenged on that, they obviously can't give you the strong atheistic answer. It's they want it to be their identity, you know, uh, authentic self and everyone has a right to be that. Um, you know, it, it is troubling when you hear someone who says they're a staunch atheist and then you get a, a well-educated religious individual and then they destroy them because they can't, you know, answer some of those tough questions. Um, but anyways, it wasn't that for me. And so I, as I continued in my journey, I realized that I couldn't um, find, you know, what I believe to be more of a compatible part, uh, you know, boyfriend or future husband or whatever, or whatever that looked like in Saskatchewan. It's a small province, as we know. Um, so Lived there for three years. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I was, I was as well. I think I was about maybe four. So I, I moved there in 2015 and I left in 2019. So um, I was, uh, I ended up coming to Calgary and uh, I got involved before I jumped from uh, Saskatchewan to Alberta. Um, I got involved with Atheist Republic and they had a consulate. So they have around 300 or more consulates around the world. Um, and I was at the time very new in my atheism and, and all of that in my humanism. Uh, I wanted to get involved and, you know, natural leadership desires and passions and all that kind of thing. And, you know, green on how to maneuver and really understand the atheistic world. And I quickly learned that gathering, you know, the non-religious, specifically atheist, agnostic, humanism, secularists into a, a room is like herding cats. And you'll hear that from many different people quote that it's very hard. Uh, but being very new to all of that still, um, I joined Atheist Republic, moved to Calgary, uh, got involved in the consulate and different atheist groups uh, that are in Calgary and finding that they all don't agree, you know, and it was a very uh, difficult community. So you have some awesome atheists out there, just like you can still have some atheist, uh, awesome uh, Christians and, and Muslims and Jews and all that. But then you can get to the negative far right extreme or to the fall far you know um extreme on the other side and uh unfortunately uh there was a lot of extremes in, in calgary that i just did not jive well with and uh you know um I, I was just like wow this is not welcoming and so um i had a you know easy to develop relationships really quickly and i quickly had a small core group who said like let's do our own thing so we we left um, in, uh, so we left Atheist Republic and uh, we broke off our connections with the local atheists and uh, non-religious groups in the area and started uh, the Secular Humanists of Calgary in February of 2020. And, you know, we, we were looking at more of a provincial thing, but we're like, you know what, let's stick small and see how we roll. And, and so there was a giant, you know, growth of interest for positive non-religious community, uh, you know, atheists and humanists and all that kind of thing. And so we started rolling that ball and, uh, you know, growing a membership, growing a, a team. But as you know, in February, um, that's when COVID hit really hard and things began to shut down. And uh, so it was, it was tough. We got, you know, everything moved from, so we had a couple of events in person, but then everything moved to a safe, uh, you know, place on Zoom as we are doing now. And, uh, you know, we, everyone got Zoom fatigued and everyone, it was just really hard. Mental health took a really big hit. You know, everyone was still trying to figure out work. And so we evolved differently. Met board members came and went just because everyone was still new to the whole thing and how we function and roll, um, you know? And uh, so we ended up, um, uh, you know, very changing how we looked and, but we did a lot of awesome things in the meantime. So we did some homeless outreaches and, and different stuff. And then uh, eventually we, uh, switched our label to more, a more provincial um, brand, which is now known as the Alberta Humanist Association. So despite I was trying to compact that into a smaller story, that's basically it in a nutshell. <laughs> I was going to say, if that's the cold notes version, I would really love to hear the actual full length interview of how the story went. But um, I want to thank you for that. And I want to start now on the actual organization. So... Mm -hmm. You, you've just mentioned you were a Calgary-based organization that kind of went provincial. And I want to know, because on your website, and I'm just, I'm going to refer back to the website here for two seconds here, because 
there's a there's a stigma around being a humanist or being an atheist or being an agnostic and anyone who's listened to the show before knows that religion and i do not see eye to eye so this is a great conversation for me so if i lose some followers it's going to be interesting but here we go um, due to the nature of our work, our volunteer team that works diligently behind the scenes must remain anonymous. Now, mm-hmm. I want to I want to dissect that a lot here for a second because there are proud Christians out there who will go on their soapboxes and yell at the top of their lungs, and you've you self identified as one when you were with the church. 100%. Why is it? I, I you you mentioned how in the Prairie Provinces of Saskatchewan, Alberta. Atheism, agnostic, secularism, humanist is probably not a uh, winning uh, argument for a lot of people, especially if you go into more rural areas. With your group growing, do you ever find a moment when you could actually say to your group or your group start telling you, okay, it's, we're willing to quote unquote come out of the closet as an atheist? Because it seems like Alberta and Saskatchewan are more willing to accept the fact that people are gay than they're willing to accept the fact that they're atheists in some sense. Is that correct Mm. in your opinion? In a lot of ways, yes. Um, You know, atheism is your... Or secularism. And and I I say atheism and I mean the umbrella term there, not just atheism. Yeah, totally. Yeah, you know, when it comes to matters of God, um, if you outright deny God, you are, you know excuse the term, but you're blacklisted, basically, you know, you're on the naughty list. Um, For a lot of religious people, there's hope, you know, I think that, um, you know, there's hope if you're LGBTQ, because that really is just, you know, um, it it becomes to a loving thing, you know, that God still, you know, there's, like I said a moment ago, there are camps of religious uh, groups out there that have embraced the LGBTQ and and I'm on the fence with that. I'm like, you know, in some respects, it's great that um, they're becoming more progressive and welcoming. And, and you know, a, a lot of children don't have a choice where their parents send them. So they could be, you know, uh, trying to figure themselves out, but pulled into a religious group that's very, you know, um, religiously, uh, but you know, um, progressive uh, and embracing of the LGBTQ. But when you're out there completely denying someone's, you know, uh, spiritual beliefs, uh, that becomes a no-no. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of issues, again, with the, mis- you know, the disinformation or mis- misinformation about secularism as being this campaign to end religion. And so when you start dealing with that specific thing, then you start getting people angry and we've had a lot of people come, you know, and, and reach out to me and the organization and saying, you know, yeah, I can't be out. I can't, t- you know, I work in a, you know, oil and gas, or I work in these different industries that are heavily, you know, either Catholic or, you know, some sort of fundamentalist religious kind of, you know, organization or, or at least primarily employed by these people. And, to, and, and they're very open about their faith, but it, I get slammed or I get discriminated when I start talking about, you know, my rights to express my non-religion, you know? And uh, so it's really hard. Some people have lost their jobs either directly or forced out by uncomfortability, discrimination. And uh, when I've talked to religious, you know, very vocal religious activists, um, you know, that are in some of these uh, places of employment, they don't, they don't mind. It's like, hey, you know, this is a Christian country. If you don't like it, go somewhere else. And uh, it's it's kind of scary that that's still existing in 2022, but it really is. How do we change that, though? Because we are, as much as some will say uh, what I'm about to say is wrong, we are a Christian uh, a country, and uh, we have prime ministers, leaders of the official opposition that will go to national prayer days. They will have, they will send out tweets on every other religious holiday, but To be elected as an atheist or an agnostic, not even here in the prairies, back in Ontario, it would be hard. So how do we change the role of religion in our society when we've had 157 years of religion being our society? Right. Well, that's that's one of the, you know, the million dollar questions, uh, Chris. Um, it, It takes time. You know what I mean? Like as as we've seen with StatsCan and different other polls that have come out that the non, uh, you know, identifying non-religious are continuing to grow and, you know, be the fastest growing movement in Canada. 
Um, sadly, most of the people that tend to get into politics are either quiet, non-religious or atheist or agnostic or humanist or however they identify us, and then very vocal religious people, you know, and um, I think there's a lot of discrimination against religious minorities. And, uh, you know, so when you start talking for whatever reason, and I, you know, I think we both know why, but when you start talking about non-religious rights, it's weirdly enough seen as an attack on the religious, even if you're not pointing a finger that way. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like you're, you're anti-religious to identify, you know, and advocate for, you know, the discriminated non-religious demographic. And so it's going to take time. It's, it's just like the extreme, you know, anti-mask, anti-vax uh, convoys that have, you know, really bubbled up over the last number of, uh, you know, years, especially, especially during COVID. Um, you know, these far right extremist groups, um, you know, they're, they're very much for, um, you know, ensuring that we have a, a Christian dominionism in Canada, you know, and they really campaign on colonialism. And that's been very vocal. Uh, so we have this strong, you know, and a lot of these, you know, we see politicians kind of gathering around for this freedom of speech and all this kind of thing. But, you know, the minute you start talking about these non-religious rights, whether in politics or anything like that, well, um, it's seen as a direct attack on the religious. So there's a, it's going to take some time to change that mindset. Um, it, it's just going to take more, you know, people like ourselves who are more out there and, and seeing that, hey, you know, we're not, you know, we're not cultists, we're not Satanists, we don't believe that those things exist. You know, we're not eating babies in the back of the, you know, of the parliament or the legislature. <laughs> we're, we're people that, you know, understand that you as as much equal right to your freedom to worship as we do have the right to freedom of religion, you know, and from religion. And so, you know, really uh, understanding the value of, of respecting each other's rights and, 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 and showing where the privilege exists. There's a lot of privilege for religion in Canada, as you mentioned, you know, we have political figures um, you know, putting on Christian colonial prayer breakfasts. You know, we have Covenant Health, which is fully funded by the public, you know, and there's tons of discrimination there. We have the Catholic separate school system, which is fully funded by your tax dollars. And they, you know, they teach and preach against homosexuality and they actually condemn and in many cases, the public school system uh, for being secular and, and so-called anti-God, you know, so we've got a lot of work to do. Um, and I know that the non-religious in Alberta specifically are waiting to hear from a politician uh, who care about their rights. And uh, so, you know, I think it does, you know, we need to challenge, um, you know, the current government, the, the next election it needs to become a platform about being inclusive, you know, and understanding that, um, uh, that we have a lot of work to do to be inclusive and those, those conversations need to, need to start happening now or last year, last week, because we're never going to fix the problems we have in, in, in uh, our, our province and in our country. And, you know, Chris, just as a side note, that doesn't help uh, all humanists for the most part. And I know there's a, you know, a few that would disagree, uh, but the secularism, the so-called secularism bill in Quebec, which if you understand the definition of secularism, uh, doesn't stand uh, to this bill. And so uh, there's a lot of people out there that say, you know what, um, your secularism is really just anti-religion, it's anti-hate, look what's happening in Quebec. And, and humanists are like, yo, we don't agree with what's going on there. And, and there has been so many key voices that have risen up within the non-religious community condemning that bill. That's not what we're campaigning for. You know, we want an inclusive society. You know, you're, it, this isn't like, um, you know, for example, and excuse the expression, but you might understand where I'm coming from. Your garments don't speak like the witch's hat in Harry Potter. You know, you, you, your garments really don't proselytize your faith. You know, we're, we're hiring you in politics and education and healthcare for your, your, your education, for your expertise. And we need all of those people. So what's going on in Quebec is, is extremely discriminating and that's not what we're campaigning for. So again, we're, we're, there's this battle and struggle with, you know, what it is that we want, that there's very few people on the, uh, you know, on the government side willing to listen. So you bring up a good point about uh, politicians co-opting the uh, word secularism, particularly in Quebec with Bill 91 and their secular, secularism law. 
There are also other myths, and you talked about them briefly there, about your, your baby killers, your Satanism, uh, sat sat satanic wor worshippers, and if you're gay, you've heard all of that thrown at you on a good day, and on a bad day, you've heard worse, so, and I'm not trying to be glib about that, it's just, it's the truth, especially if you lived in rural Ontario, like I did, I'm assuming like Jonathan did. Um, how do you fight back? How do you fight back against that? Because, okay, I'm, I'm giving you my platform to talk about this, and I'm glad that I'm doing it because you, you're you giving a voice to myself and a lot of other people out there who are struggling with religion. And um, anyone who's listened to the show before knows that I've been dealing with cancer. When you said cancer, I kind of stopped there for a few seconds and I tuned out, but then I came back, so I did. Um, and I, am the, I, I lost my partner on the Highway uh, 62 and number 7 in uh, Prince Edward uh, Hastings, so literally near where Madoc is from. And uh, after that, I left the religion and I completely became sort of a atheist because I said any person, any god or deity that decides to do that to somebody is just cruel, in my opinion. So you are giving the voice, and I'm saying that. But at the other hand, I'll have the that. I'll have a pastor on, I'll have a rabbi on, because I think everyone has the right to have their voice, and I, I want to give the platform to give that voice. How do we fight back, though? How do we actually get this to change? I know it starts takes time, but if media won't cover this, if politicians don't care about the 1.5 million and growing population, according to the last census. And they care about the loud vocal minority on Twitter. How do we how do we fight not fight back? How do we challenge the status quo? And how do we start? Because it is a long conversation, but until we start, we can't change. So how do we start it? For sure. Um, you know, and I'm I'm gonna pick on the Christians for a moment, but not necessarily intentionally. Um, there's, there's a saying, if you scratch a Christian, you find out what they're made of. And I want to turn that mirror onto the non-religious, the atheist, the humanist, the agnostic, etc. If you scratch an atheist, you find out what they're made of. Um, we can't respond in like manner. You know, that's where it starts. So it starts individually. You know, as I was saying, I, I transitioned from Regina to Calgary. And I got a good look at what was the non-religious landscape, the, you know, the atheist landscape in Calgary. And I was disgusted. I said, how are we building bridges? How are we different? You know, and we see that in a political stage where, you know, one party is divisive and condemning the other one. And then the other one comes back and they, they shoot the same pot shots and we can't behave like that. And so, you know, and I know there's a ton of good people out there, you know, uh, and I'd say a vast majority of humanists and atheists and out there that are not like that. And I commend them for it. And that's where it starts. You know, um, if people want to, you know, treat us horribly, do what they're, and, I, and forgive the expression, but do what their fictional savior would do. Turn the other cheek, turn your back to them and let them give you the 30 lashes, um, but get involved. You know, and so start showing your authentic, genuine self. If you're a humanist specifically, be humanist, be compassionate, be understanding, you know, unpack why and where they're coming from. Does that mean you need to hug, hug them all day long and sing Kumbaya? No, absolutely not. You know, obviously, if we come in and encounter people who are, you know, very negative and, and all that kind of thing, there's always going to be negativity and criticism. There's always going to be something you could have done better. But learn to listen to the criticisms and course correct if, there, if there's a necessity for it, you know, and start getting involved and start showing people like, you know, for myself, um, I'm criticized because I, on my Facebook page, if you scroll through it, you're going to see me, you know, worshiping, my, uh, worshiping, you're going to see me, you know, um, uh, kind of celebrating my friend, you know, people who are uh, maybe Muslim in my, my friendship uh, circles who celebrate, you know, Eid or, um, you know, Hanukkah or all that, it, you know, none of those things bother me. And those things are important to them. And it's just part of being in a relationship. Do I believe those beliefs? Absolutely not. But do I support the people that I love that come from different walks of life, different faith communities that are, are, are completely different than my beliefs? Then, yeah, I'm going to, you know, um, if my friend invited me somewhere that they were doing something that was a community event, part of their, you know, their faith cr group, would I you know, uh, give them, you know, rude or aggressive opposition. Absolutely not. You know, I, I walk out and walk, I walk in and walk out unscathed outside of, 
I had a great, you know, community opportunity. So we need to change our approach on how we see each other. We need to be more, you know, globalists in our thinking that we share one planet with so many different types of people. And the only thing that's going to change is us and how we approach things to make it better. So it has to start with us. You know, we need to start showing people that we're not these, you know, negative or uh, atheists or negative people. And, and there are out there, you know, and it's just like an abused victim. If you remain a victim your whole life, uh, it's going to damage you. You know, a lot of people come out of these religious or, you know, communities, faith groups, and they're battered and beaten. And, you know, it's, it's like beating a dog or beating another defenseless animal. And, you know, it's going to take a while to, to really, you know, let them let their guard down before you can get into their inner circle. But those people that have had that experience, when they're ready to, they need to seek some, some help. You know, um, they need to seek some advice and, and, you know, work through that trauma because there is definitely serious trauma after leaving a very fundamentalist religion or any kind of faith community that's told you to deny yourself or hate yourself and, you know, and to turn your life over to this deity. And, you know, you've learned how to just, you know, um, to self-hate, you know, and there's a lot of that there, you know, denialism and all that kind of thing. And there's, you know, ideas of sexual purity and all these things that we know that, you know, that don't line up with science and, and the human makeup. And so there's a journey that we need to take. And it's very important that we start as soon as possible, identify those areas, become self-aware, un unpack that trauma and damage and invite people that are safe and professional to help unpack it with you. You know, and if you grow up in an abused family, um, you know, there's, you have to expect that you're going to manifest some sort of negativity in your life. And sometimes we're not aware of it. Yeah. And we can't engage these communities if we're still carrying that baggage. And so we need to change because eventually, as we have said numerous times on this show so far, that the non-religious community is growing. And it's not just from people never encountering faith or encountering faith and denying it, but it's also from the camp of former members. And there has to be, so that's something that if I could really campaign on this, this chat with you, Chris, is that the government really needs to start coming up with ways to, you know, we have so many different channels of mental health uh, that is available to the community. But I think one specifically for people who have experienced religious trauma, I think that should be important. A lot of people don't know where to go. How do I get help? This is a very unique thing, you know, and how do we talk about that where I'm validating my feelings, you know, and you're not kind of judging me on, you know, uh, my journey and how I look at things right now. So I think that's, it starts with us. It really, really does. Uh, and then it also starts with the government being accountable to, you know, pluralism and secularism and, you know, inclusivity. So, you know, there's a lot of, as we said, a lot of prayer breakfasts or, different events that the the government will uh, you know support or show up to and we've seen that in all you know the UCP the NDP the liberal party and, and all the uh, you know all those but we start need to start seeing them connecting with the non-religious community hey if we've got 100 or 1.5 million non-religious there's a voter base right there what are you doing for that camp you're doing different things for the the religious community to to get that voter at least understand that community to see how as a government we can support this faith group or that faith group. So what is the government doing to support the non-religious community? How are we facilitating yeah. you know, inclusivity so that the non-religious aren't you know, um, you know, supporting a religious mandate in any way? You know? and, and they really need to be honest with that. So I think there's a couple different uh, things that need to happen. It starts with ourselves. And I think, it, you know, the other part needs to start with the government, because if we looked at the polls in Ontario, um, you know, the voter turnout was there was a lot of apathy there. And I, I know a lot of non-religious, you know, uh, connected with tons of groups. You know, Ontario is obviously my home uh, from where I came from. Uh, so I connected with a, non, a lot of a lot of the non-religious people and they were looking for a platform that were touching on some of these key areas when it comes to the religious, you know, uh, demographic and none of them were really campaigning for them. So I know a lot of them didn't vote. If we all remember back to 2007, and just Jonathan and I might know this a little bit better from our Alberta listeners, but in 27, 2007, 
then progressive conservative leader can leadership candidate John Tory, now mayor of Toronto, campaigned on a bill on a pledge to fund all religious schools. And that went over like a bat out of hell, pardon my French, because a lot of people were very upset that potentially we would be having public schools funded that were worship, uh, worshiping Satan and witchcraft. And then at the end of the day, people started asking the question of, well, why are we uh, like funding the Catholic school board? Because that just doesn't seem right. If you're doing one, you need to do all. So here we are. <laughs> Um, right. I want to ask a tough question, and I did not prepare you for this. And I, I, I always like to ask the one tough question during the interview, and that is, uh, and if you don't want to answer it, it's completely understandable. But I'm going to play a little bit of a devil's advocate here, because there's someone listening to this episode right now saying you left the church. You left the church. You then went to the Atheist Republic. And then started the uh, Calgary Atheist Humanist Society, if that's it's the like correct. Calgary Humanist of Calgary. Yeah. Sorry, and then uh, which formed into the Alberta Humanist Association. What is the difference between your organization and a church? Hmm. Well, I think that's uh, a great question, and I have been asked that before. Um, and to be frank with you, there is never an answer that um that is good enough for those who ask that question really you know you could draw them um a great diagram and dissect it even do hand puppets and they're never satisfied with the answer that you give um and i've tried to you know almost do handstands and different type of you know uh positions to really get this message across, um, you know, one is specifically mandated for, you know, um, something that cannot be, um, you know, uh, confirmed through science and there's no evidence for, has filled with a lot of errors, um, you know, has caused so many, you know, bloodbaths over the centuries, you know, whatever major, you know, kind of world religion, not all of them, but quite a few of them. Um, and then the other one is campaigning for, you know, a press, a, a progressive, um, you know, worldview for humanity. You know, um, they always ask me, like, you know, just to kind of give you an illustration, you know, what's out there in the world best that is going on that best illustrates your vision of what humanists are really looking for. And I am a huge sci-fi nerd. Um, and I've absolutely, from a small child, fell in love with Gene Roddenberry. Gene Roddenberry was a vocal humanist, and he envisioned um, a time where humanity would kind of throw off those shackles of division and, you know, um, superstition and all that kind of thing, come together and climb out of the cradle known as Earth and step into uh, you know, a new existence where there's there's no discrimination on any level. And if there's, I know that sounds like a utopia and we label it that, but if if we can really frame that down, that's the worldview that uh, humanists are, are, you know, campaigning for and have campaigned for. And that's a very different worldview or expression or even an organization than a faith community, whereas a faith community as I know it to be and uh, a lot of others would attest to is, is a group of people gathered around this book um, that they firmly and, and wholeheartedly agree that a, a supernatural being came and will one day destroy the planet uh, of all of its sin and create a new heaven and a new earth for you know, the, his chosen where the ones that reject him will burn forever in eternal fire. And, you know, this is kind of what they're campaigning for. And so it's a very different, it's like one's yeah. going one way and one's going the other, right? Yeah. And we're, we're campaigning for the end of, you know, racism, the end of trans and, and LGBT phobia and the end of, you know, uh, discrimination on and every imaginable level. Um, and the other one is holding to these, well, you know, if God spoke it, then he wanted it kind of, you know, and I'm hoping I'm answering this. The you, best. You, it's just like, 
You are. You are completely answering it. And the moment you said Gene Roddenberry, I all I could picture in my head was the uh, Will Ferrell and John C. Riley. Did we just become best friends? Meme because that is literally what I've been thinking for the last probably nine years. Well, since well more than nine years, ten years as of. Uh, 12, 13, 13 years. Wow. 2009. So I, I completely understand where you're coming from and I, I appreciate you answering that, but I want to turn because we are, we're literally coming up, up on the hour, but I have one last set of questions I want to ask, talk to you about, and that's the future. What does the future hold for the Alberta Humanist Association? What are you planning? Is there events coming up? Uh, what like, because I know you, you talked about the election and how you want to sort of have a sort of narrative in that next election for that 1.5 million, uh, non-religious uh, Albertans out there. So what are your plans and what is the association's plans in the future? Um, it, great question. And to be really honest with you, a lot of it is up in the air. Um, I got involved a lot with um, uh, some volunteer things that are in a lot of the same lines, what I'm doing with the Alberta Humanist Association and what I'm hoping to see happen with some of the key things that we're campaigning for. Um, but, uh, you know, as I was saying earlier, um, the old quote, it's hard to, you know, gather cats in a bag because they just, you know, scramble out. Um, and so it's hard. It's, you know, the history of the Alberta Humanists, we launched really as the Secular Humanists of Calgary, and it was difficult. We've been through an evolution of board members. Uh, so many, you know, people who've never been on a board before, and once they got an un understanding of you know, what's entailed, um, you know, kind of got out of there as fast as they could because it does, it's volunteer, there's no pay, right? Um, and so uh, really it's, it, I feel like I'm the guy behind the curtain and the Wizard of Oz. So I'm pulling all the levers and everything. It, it's a lot. Uh, there's a few other people that are, are behind the background but they're not able to dedicate that time. Um, so we're working on a, a, a couple of things and, and, and I see myself specifically um, you know, uh, I've been reaching out to different political parties. Um, as you, if you follow my Twitter, if you follow my uh, Facebook page, uh, if you follow the Alberta Humanist, um, you'll see that we have a campaign Twitter account, uh, and it's the one public school system for Alberta. So uh, before the, the hit of COVID, uh, it was in the news all the time. You know, massive discrimination is coming to the surface within the Catholic separate school system. We had former David. Uh, you know, uh, King, former uh, education minister, you know, with the progressive conservatives back in the late 70s and 80s who was campaigning for a long time, uh, you know, different camps that were out there saying, hey, we really want to see a merge of the public school system come together. Uh, so, but because of COVID, that hit the main news and, and all these other, you know, uh, things kind of hit the back burner. So I'm really trying to reignite the conversation again. Um, you know, David King said it's probably going to be about 10 years before we really see some uh, of the, he you know, the hard work come to, to fruition. And so I'm really trying to keep it going. Um, so that's one of my main strongest campaigns right now. If you go to the uh, um, humanistalberta.com, uh, you'll see that there's, um, you know, a website page dedicated to the one public school system. So I'm working on that as, as often as I possibly can to come up with pages to re-educate people. Again, it's been since 2019, since we've seen it all in the headlines. So uh, the time is now to start getting people on board. And I know inflation and you know all these other things that are hitting people really hard has, is pushing this down the importance on the poll. Um, but I'm really hoping to, I'm like, hey, we're losing teachers left, right, and center. Educational institutes, children are gonna suffer within bigger class sizes. You know, the UCP has been defunding education and, and we know that they have a love for pro, uh, privatization. Uh, we have a 16 tier education system with, you know, charter schools and private schools and a completely duplicate, unnecessary Catholic education system. We need to merge those. Let's put a cap on those charters and the private. We can deal with that very soon. But one of our biggest hemorrhages of money is coming through, you know, um, even if there wasn't an issue with, um, you know, the UCP kind of cutting funds, it's still, we're looking at uh, 200 to 800 million that could be put back into the classroom. Uh, and so that's really important, right? Um, you know, duplicated bus services when you've got a Catholic school and a public school right across, you know, uh, the, the a small town where the, you know, um, yeah. or busing a Catholic, you know, bus all the way to another town because they don't have one in one and they have a public school and they're both half full. So um, it's, that's been one of the big things that the Alberta Humanist is really talking about. 
And uh, we have reached out to some political parties and we got some great feedback. And so please continue to follow um, that uh, on my Twitter account, especially I'm much more active there and uh, keep looking at the website. That's where, what we're really focused on the future. Um, I'm probably, I'm trying to figure out where I want to be situated within the organization because as I get way more focused on that, uh, it becomes harder and harder for me to have uh, side events. So um, we've really kind of put a, a temporary stop measure on eventing like uh, community events. If you go to the page, you know, for a long time, we did some great successful skept talks, uh, had awesome, you know, guest speakers from, you know, different spectrums that uh, were really wonderful. Uh, comedian nights, movie nights, uh, walk parties where we went around and just, you know, stayed our separate distance, but got to know some of the members. Those were all wonderful things. Um, but when there's lack of volunteers, there's a lack of events. And uh, so we've really kind of put a stop on that. Um, you know, we're kind of co-partnering with the, um, the BC Humanist Association with Ian Bushfield, amazing uh, guy over there. And uh, he and uh, his research team have given us a lot of pointers on kind of what we need to be focusing on and, and you know, what's really not important. Uh, so there's a lot of things in the works, um, but uh, we're more digital more so now than we are, you know, in-person communal, which I do miss that aspect. And uh, so my pitch to anyone listening if you are in the area, especially in Calgary, but even if you're different er uh, you know, parts of the, of the province, um, if you would love to reach out to me and say, hey, Jonathan, I am interested in taking on Skeptox again. Let's get this digital you know, uh, platform back rolling again. I would welcome uh, a Zoom chat with you. Uh, you can reach out to me more better off to do it uh, through a DM on Twitter or hit me up on Facebook um, you know, and send me a direct message that way. Uh, and I would love to chat with you, but um, for the time being, Chris, we're just basically focused more so on our campaigns, because I know yeah. those are at the heart of uh, what Albertans that are, uh, you know, on our membership or, you know, and we're still getting out there. Funny enough, even though we've been out there and I've got blasting Twitters and even paid promotions and stuff like that, you know, we haven't reached 1.5 million non-religious. And even though, again, that obviously makes up different demographics. So there's still a lot of people that don't know. Uh, that we exist. So I appreciate this opportunity to chat with you because now that gives us more exposure and people are going to, you know, connect with us that way and say, hey, there's a voice out there for me. And yeah, they are hitting some of the serious key issues that matter to me that no one else has spoken out before because the Alberta humanist is in its, its, its entirety a very first for Alberta. So we've never had a provincial atheist, humanist, positive, inclusive community to speak on behalf of this demographic. And so it's important, you know, there are some new atheists out there that are, you know, not always the friendly folk. And sometimes that becomes the, you know, the angry atheist uh, image. And so, no, that's, you know, we're, we're definitely uh, positive, inclusive. And, um, and I know a lot of people are happy that we're out there uh, giving them a platform. Well, I appreciate that. And to my listeners from here in Calgary, from Vancouver to St. John's, uh, Newfoundland, to Whitehorse, to Toronto, um, check it out. The links to Jonathan's Twitter account, the links to the albertahumanist.com website, the links to the Facebook pages, everything that Jonathan just mentioned will be in the show notes. I'm going to do my research and trying to collect everything so I can put it all in one neat little package for everyone. But check it out. Get involved. Um, if, if you're a non-believer, if you're a believer, if you want to learn more about the organization, have a conversation. It's it's a weird concept for a lot of people these days, but uh, the links will be there. You can reach out. I'm assuming Jonathan likes to spar with a lot of people if he's if he's active on Twitter as much as I've seen him active on Twitter, and he's willing to talk about subjects that sometimes people don't want to talk about. But I'm glad that you were able to come on the show, talk about this, and thank you so much for being and doing what you do. Well, Chris, thank you. I really appreciated you reaching out and uh, making this possible and, and being able to connect now with more who uh, are interested on this, you know, and, and feel like their, their identities were given an opportunity today. So uh, to be heard and seen. So thank you. No worries. So with that, my name is being Christopher. My name has been. My name is Christopher Brown. This has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, Get out from behind the Twitter for like for at least an hour sometimes and just go have a conversation with somebody because it does make our society better and it 
it bridges the gaps that we need to bridge before the be before we become more divided than we already are. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. Remember, guys, keep talking. Mm-hmm.